in the comments to one of my videos, someone asked me, what are some things that uh, you aren't prepared for when going into work in the chemical and process industry? What are the things that uh, university fails to point out? So here's a list of three things that for me were quite surprising when I started working. The first thing, it's a bit of a silly one, but it's the sheer amount of piping on chemical plants. You walk onto a plant and it's like a spaghetti bowl of piping and the feeling you get is how can anyone know what's in all of those pipes, where they go and what needs to be done with them because obviously someone needs to know if this place is to be run safely. Some examples of piping uh, that will appear on a chemical plant. Right off the bat I can think of three different types of air that you need. Instrument air, breathing air and compressed air. Right. Start with compressed air. Compressed air is just regular compressed air that you've taken through an air compressor and um, you'll use it to run say pneumatic tools or run air driven pumps that aren't uh, that are only used uh, intermittently. Then you get instrument air which obviously is also compressed air but instrument air is, has very stringent requirements about being first of all oil free. You don't want to send oil to the instruments that this air is going to be running. And the other thing is uh, we specify a dew point for the air and that's an indication of how dry the air is because you don't want wet air going into your instrumentation. And the third type is breathing air which is you know uh, air that you are okay with putting through your lungs which also should be grease free just like your instrument there but uh, you don't want to be breathing really dry air and you'd use it in a situation where you've got a breathing apparatus or gas mask on so that you can carry out work either because oxygen concentrations are low in a certain area or inside a vessel or and you can't bring it up to a normal atmosphere or else you're doing work in a in an area that contains uh, the fumes of hazardous chemicals that also can't be removed so to protect the person doing the work so there's three types of air lines piping that needs to be piped to all parts of the plant in and amongst your process lines then you've got nitrogen. Nitrogen is used to inertize equipment. So you run it through uh, piping and vessels and things to purge it of this, the contents uh, while not creating an explosive environment. You couldn't use air for that because you'd introduce oxygen and potentially uh, you've got an, you're dealing with an explosive chemical. So you don't just throw air into it. Then you've got cooling water. If you've done anything about heat exchangers, you've probably talked about cooling water. But instead of on your PNIDs showing, okay, here's the cooling water supply and return, those supply and return lines, they need to come from somewhere and those lines run across your plant. So this, just for every heat exchanger that uses cooling water, you've got two extra lines running across your plant. Then there's steam and condensate lines. Maybe you use steam as, uh, as a utility in your process. Maybe you produce it as part of your process. But where you have steam, you have condensate. Condensate is the steam that uh, liquefies and you need to get rid of that condensate out of your piping because when you have two phases flowing in a, in a pipeline at very high velocities, steam lines are usually at very high velocities, uh, then it can cause serious damage. Uh, the, the, the effect is called water hammer. And so you've got lines to and steam traps to get rid of that condensate so as soon as you have one steam line, you'll have multiple condensate lines or, or uh, condensate traps on it. And so the piping just multiplies by N when, when you do this. So the first time you step onto a plant, you'll think, yeah, you'll have that feeling of what the hell's going on here. Go and select one of those lines arbitrarily and go walk, walk along it and see where does it go? Uh, where does it terminate? What instrumentation, if any, is on it? Uh, go check if it's on a drawing. Go check if that drawing is even accurate because especially utility diagrams, they're not used that much or as frequently as your main process diagrams. So go check whether it's depicted correctly. Apart from the piping itself, I was also shocked at how many pumps there were. I thought uh, when doing process, process flow diagrams in, uh, at university that uh, you, you used a pump to increase liquid pressure. 
but it turns it turns out you do that all the time if you want to move the liquid so you'd have at university two blocks with a line going through it uh, from uh, between them uh, to show flow but how do you achieve that flow you need a pump so i was just aghast at how many pumps were on the first plant uh, that i worked on and i remember thinking you're an idiot obviously they're there but uh, but yeah so that was also a surprise the second thing that really surprised me was mass and energy they don't balance okay obviously they balance the the principle works and uh, mass and energy balances will still work if you go and work for a design house and do flow sheeting where you are specifying the mass balance but as soon as you go out onto a real plant uh, things get wild really quickly. The first problem is you likely don't have enough instrumentation to even check whether the mass balance closes. Flow meters are expensive instruments. You don't just put them on every stream going into and out of a chemical plant. Here's a great example. I spoke about cooling water supply and return lines. Usually you pipe cooling water to a plant and then you tap off of the main cooling water supply header to all your consumers, meaning all the pieces of equipment that require cooling water. Each of those consumers is not going to have a flow meter on it. You just supply the correct pressure and then you return it in a cooling water return header. You will never know how much cooling water is in there unless you go and take some sort of initiative to measure it somehow or do it via energy balance by calculating the other side of the heat exchanger. So. The point is, you, you, you're never in a position where you have all the flows in and all the flows out and you can say, oh cool, in equals out, great. Then other times you have the opposite problem where you almost have too much information. An example of this is, imagine you have a piece of equipment and you've got the flow rate into it and you've got the temperature going into it. You may have some sort of uh, reaction taking place or something taking place where you're able to calculate the outlet temperature. You do that calculation, you get the outlet and you find that, hold on, if this inlet and inlet flow and temperature are correct, there is no way that my outlet temperature reading is what my instrument is showing me. And so you're left thinking, all right, maybe the outlet is wrong, but why should it be the outlet? Maybe the flow is wrong, maybe the inlet temperature is wrong. And I think the, in most cases, you either find that someone says, oh yeah, that, that instrument, it's never worked. The, it's sort of hand wavy and well, why doesn't it work and why hasn't anyone fixed it? If that is the case, you should be the person to, to drive fixing that instrument. Um, but the other thing is, it might not be a single instrument that's wrong. Most likely, it's a combination of them. It's, it's that they're all wrong to varying extent. You learn very quickly that temperatures are, they're, they're fickle things. You can change the temperature shown by a thermocouple by many degrees, simply by changing its position inside the pipe or vessel where it's measuring. I worked on incinerators working at up to 1000 degrees Celsius where you could change the temperature, you could measure a different temperature uh, simply by moving the thermocouple half a meter. And I'm talking about a difference of hundreds of degrees. Quite literally, I could uh, get, a, get a reading 200 degrees lower, depending on where I moved it in this vessel. And so you think, I used to round off temperatures to like one decimal place, like what the hell was I doing? Then there's the issue of heat loss. Even with no unit operation, just a pipeline, if it's running hot and you measure the temperature at the start and at the end and it's a, you know, a few meters long or dozens of meters long, there will be heat loss in that pipeline. So uh, if the heat loss is significant compared to say the heat of reaction, well then you can't really use the inlet and outlet temperatures of a reactor to tell you something about the extent of the reaction taking place. Now, a design company will assume that there is some sort of heat loss because when they deliver the equipment to you, they need to guarantee that it's able to work. And if heat loss is an issue, they need to put in enough safety margins so that it doesn't compromise the operation of the process. They are not going to share what that heat loss is with you. That's part of their intellectual property or their know-how, how they design their equipment. So they're not going to give it to you. 
and maybe you could come up with some sort of estimate, but you'll never have a way of really verifying whether that estimate for heat loss is an accurate one. So I guess the summary is enjoy your mass and energy while they still balance. Finally, university does not prepare you for dealing with people. And in this case, I'm going to talk about that operator. Who's that operator? That operator is a dude who's been working there for 40 years. It's always a guy. Uh, so he was started working there before your parents even met, probably. So he knows the place like the back of his hand. When things go really wrong, even the plant manager will ask that operator what they should be, what, what you should be doing to get yourself out of a certain situation. You are going to clash with that operator. He's going to say some things you don't like technically. So he's going to say something that obviously is scientifically not correct. There's some BS happening, but there's reasons he says it because, well, he's seen something happen so many times that that he, he maybe they've said like, well, we always see uh, this level reads lower when the temperatures, when it's raining. And you think it's, it, it kind of sounds like pseudoscience, but maybe there's something to it and it's difficult to tell. Anyways, he's, he's also going to say things that you don't like personally. He's probably going to piss you off. He's probably going to make you hate that plant, your job, maybe the company, maybe even your career path and there's nothing you can do to prepare for it. You need to be able not to take that sort of thing personally. And I, I don't know how you do that if you're someone who is quite high in, in, in empathy and, uh, and you know really listens to people. Uh, brush it off, look at it from his perspective. That's the best advice I can give you. Think of some of the people either in your class right now or the people, if you've graduated, the people you graduated with. I guarantee you, you think a lot of people are complete assholes, right? You don't think that there's anything particularly brilliant about them. Just because they have an engineering degree, it, it says nothing about their intelligence. It says nothing about their abilities, their motivation, uh, their work ethic. If you think there's people in your class that are complete assholes, how can you expect that operator not to feel the same? What he sees every year is engineers rotating through his plant. They're only there for a year because this plant is just a stepping stone or it's one stage in a series of rotations. They come out of university with a degree and they're highly arrogant and they want to make changes and they know what's best. But that operator, he's seen that every single year and you're going to have ideas about changes you want to make or things you want to try. And that operator can name three engineers before you that wanted or did try that thing and it didn't work. So it can be really demotivating. The best advice I can give you is other than not take things personally, when dealing with that person, listen and ask questions more than you make statements or say things, right? Listen rather than speak. If you show them that you're able to take a step back, admit what you don't know, demonstrate that you value his opinions and, and his experiences on the plant, you'll see that they slowly start warming up to you and eventually they'll tell you that they have an idea or they always thought that they could do this. One day they'll ask you, why is it that this happens? You think, oh, so you don't know that. Hold on, I can explain something to you. That's great. That's a really satisfying feeling. But if you decided on day one to take on board some crass thing that they said, uh, it, it, it's just not going to go as well. So shake it off, shake it off. You, you, you don't need to be best friends with this person. But potentially there's a healthy working relationship that you can have if you're patient enough. Right, so, so my wife's comment was actually a brilliant one uh, th that maybe I should have started with on what does a university not prepare you for. You will not be prepared out of university for that feeling of not knowing what's going on. You have a degree, you have a lot of knowledge, you've put in a lot of hours and you've got no confidence about what you've learned. Someone can ask you to make a call about something, they'll say. We use half inch or quarter inch piping in this situation and it's, uh, yeah, the person in your position before you was the one making the call, which should it be? And you think, well, not only don't I know the answer to this question, I don't know how to arrive at the answer to this question. University doesn't prepare you for that feeling that it's, it, I don't know how to make a call. I don't know what's right. You, 
you eventually, with time, it doesn't happen overnight, you get to a point where you're able to say, yeah, this is what needs to be done or this is how big it needs to be without doing the calculations necessarily or without double checking and looking for consensus. I think it was in my first year of university, a lecture, one of our lecturers asked, uh, I need you to estimate this, uh, the volume of water in an Olympic sized swimming pool. And the natural response to the question by everyone was, well, how big is an Olympic sized swimming pool? And asking that question showed that you're not, you didn't understand what he was trying to demonstrate. He's trying to say, that information doesn't exist. Give me your best guess.